So I wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us during the holiday season for the Retail Tech Forum. Uh, so I work with uh, Owen at S. We are an education and economic development nonprofit. We focus on innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship for fashion and design industries. Um, and then Retail Tech Forum is part of Retail Tech Summit, and what we are doing is working on developing the innovation ecosystem around retail technology in San Francisco. So um, one of the great things about San Francisco is you know you can get people from great companies, executives, thought leaders together um, for small format seminars like this one. So um, tonight we have executives and thought leaders from uh, many great companies, uh, SAP, Levi Strauss and Company, Beta Brand, Avenue Code, and also uh, Iron Creative Communications. So I'll introduce, uh, the moderator tonight is Matt Cook. He's head of user experience for Iron Creative Communications, and he's also the vice president of the Retail Design Institute for Northern California. Um, so before we get to that, I want to introduce uh, Livia from General Assembly, and General Assembly is our gracious host tonight with these facilities, and uh, we're in partnership with them tonight. Can you guys hear me? I might just shout um, in case it cuts out. But my name is Olivia, and I work with General Assembly. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with General Assembly, in San Francisco, uh, we are one of nine campuses around the globe. So GA is originally from New York, where we started out as a community for entrepreneurs. And we've really grown since then into a global network of individuals who are learning uh, practical skills in tech, uh, entrepreneurship, and design. And so we teach programs like digital marketing, data science, front-end web development, back-end web development, full web development immersive programs, and uh, also user experience design is a huge focus for us. And so we're really happy to partner up this evening um, and host you all uh, for this wonderful event. And if you have any questions about General Assembly, Julie's going to be here this evening. She's in the back if you want to wave to Julie. And we have some brochures if you want to grab them. But welcome. Enjoy. Uh, so my name is Paul Friedland. I'm a director of marketing at Levi Strauss. Uh, just down the street, not too far from here. Um, and I oversee all of our wholesale marketing. So we have store e and traffic running and marketing. So really, anything from a consumer experience standpoint that touches our major accounts or any account. So that's everything from Amazon to Macy's, Urban Outfitters, um, you name it, wherever we're Paul Soker. I am a uh, director of technology at Code. Uh, we are a solutions and uh, agile technology provider to many of the big name uh, e-commerce shops around the Bay Area. So we work with Macy's, Walmart, Gap, Bloom Sonoma, the likes. And uh, usually we bring in um, a development expertise. We bring in uh, processes, transformation of their existing um, existing development processes and cycle. So I have personally witnessed uh, many implementations and the in-house technologies that people tend to use and the direction of evolution that things are moving towards. So uh, that's my background. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Aaron Magnus. I'm with a small startup here called Beta Brand. I'm pretty excited about what we're doing in the online fashion apparel space. Um, a lot of people, if this, does anyone know what Beta Brand is? Yeah. Yes. yes. I'll leave you now. <laughs> no, uh, no. One thing's exciting, you know. I think a lot of people know us for some, you know, uh, very newsworthy type products, a lot of disco type products, executive hoodies, things like that. But um, we also you know, sell a lot of staple products. Everything I'm wearing from Beta Brand, not just because I'm coming here tonight. But you know, I think we're we're doing some interesting things in uh, the the apparel space, moving how uh, traditional retailers. I uh, can think about bringing products to life and who's involved in that process and excited to talk more about them. Hello everyone, my name is Lee Gong. I am a VP of a Product Innovation in SAP Labs in Palo Alto, although I live in San Francisco. So what I do in SAP, which is a big uh, enterprise software company, is I lead a new product development team by focusing on actually connecting businesses with uh, consumers through technology. So when I was a kid, actually I wanted to study fashion design, but my dad said no. 
Now, how many of you are fashion designers? Just a few of you. Then, actually, fashion is a, such a thing that can very flexibly leverage technology from the design to trying to uh, sharing with friends in the social community. So what I'm focusing, focusing on in my job now is actually um, connecting consumers with the brands they like and through mobile and different types of technology. I'd be happy to share some of those specific focuses. So uh, thank you for your introduction. Um, as Robert said, my name is I'm head of user experience at Line Creative. We specialize in uh, digital experiences in the retail sector and I'm also the vice president of the Retail Design Institute here in California. Um, so, without further ado, the first question is, innovation is closely linked to experimentation, but how much can you experiment with big brands that people may be emotionally connected to, and retail, which can often be very slow moving? And I'll just preface this by saying, you know, I think when Gap redesigned their logo last year or two years ago, there was a huge public backlash, and it was a big surprise to the brand, it was a big surprise to us all in the community. And then they took that logo back off the marketplace and put their old logo back up because people are very attached to brands. So uh, once again, uh, innovation is closely linked to experimentation, but how much can you experiment with big brands? Anyone on the panel? <laughs> Personal experience. <laughs> My personal experience is with experimentation on uh, the e-commerce platforms that we work with. So what we've seen is a personalization of the experience, the whole customer experience, coming from navigation, uh, from recommendations, from the ads you see. So it's almost like a, if you wanted to go as far as you could, you could push it to a personalized rec recommendation experience for everybody who lands on the site. So you could tailor it by time of day, where you're coming from, your buying history, things that are very personal to you and therefore make it seem like it's really your shop. And uh, there's there's so much you can do that with the, with the online experience that I think would be a lot harder with the brick and mortar, uh, especially in terms of actually tailoring it towards personal taste and personal history. Uh, anyone have any, any, any thoughts on, on slow moving retail? So it's on the one hand very easy or relatively easy to do online. Um, what about on floor? Um, how easy is it to innovate? Um, it's hard. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, it, I'll answer it in, I guess, a couple parts. I, I think the first part is it's hard, um, especially when you start talking about physical spaces, inventory that you've got to carry. If stuff doesn't sell, what do you do with it, et cetera. So there's a pretty big liability there. But I think the flip side to it is at this day and age, the consumer's expecting it, right? Um, they're expecting newness, they're expecting innovation, they're expecting that when they walk into the store, they're gonna see something that they haven't seen. So, uh, you know, the ability to innovate, change, and update, and move quickly, it's expected from the consumer, and I think, and we talked a little, little bit about it before, you know, those retailers and the, those brands that don't are gonna lose. Those that do are gonna win, and not to simplify it, but quite frankly, it is that simple. Um, and I think to a good extent that applies certainly to brick and mortar. Um, and I think it also applies to e-com. And as we start looking at, and I hate saying this because it gets overused, omni-channel, um, you know, but it is true. And I think, you know, that innovation and that experimentation is an integral part to bringing brick and mortar and e-com and m-com on your phone together. And I also think the consumer has a certain amount of tolerance for it. I think they recognize that, you know, as long as what you're serving up to them is relevant and appropriate and contextual, there's a certain amount of patience there. I'd actually like to hear more, because you're working with old brands that have brick and mortar presence. Are you taking some of the learnings from e-com into brick and mortar? And then secondly, you take people like Target, who I think they just launched in caps for Target Awesome or something like that, where they're using most pin you know, so a very, very offline, not, not only off site, you know, but third party and bring it into their physical experience. So I think there's a lot of interesting um, innovation going on in retail, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I think, I think people are certainly trying to integrate the in source, uh, in store point of sales experience with what you experience online, what you can do online. So, a prime example is like um, there are initiatives around having like if you have coupons, right? So you can digitize them, put them on your phone, take the same coupon to the store, and then use that coupon, right? So essentially, it's, everything is now instead of having paper clippings, 
you now have everything on your phone. So you can use the same coupon on the website, you can use the same coupon with your phone on in the store. So it's a, it's a pretty good integration, I think, of, uh, of the digital experience across all platforms. I have one technique to share. First of all, I agree to especially uh, Paul's point. Fragmentation is inevitable uh, part of the innovation uh, process. So what we, do? we use design thinking uh, in my job as uh, a process of innovation. When I work with different brands, one technique is prototyping. Not only can do uh, physical prototyping, I show you with exa one uh, example, Kaiser Permanente, they employ design thinking in some of their innovation uh, processes for their uh, patient experience works. So they, so they create a mock-up hospital, just like one couple of a typical room, available on board, etc. in one location. Then they bring nurses, the doctors, and the patients in to experiment with that uh, physical prototype. They virtual prototype, virtual, virtual prototype of the Prashant was in India. But then I was talking with an animation company. So then I was working with a customer, a brand in New York City. So we were exploring a future scenario is using 3D simulation, 3D, 3D animation to virtually prototype a store format and the layout and the, the uh, display of the products and the movement of people. Beyond Second Life, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. Um, next question. Technology is a key driver in the democratization of fashion. At what point does this democratization become harmful to brand equity? Or is democratization building brand equity? Thanks. It's somewhat tailored for Aaron's question. Yeah, you know, I think what we are doing is bringing the hopefully, uh, some level of democratization to the design process, decision-making process, buying process. I think there's a lot of retailers out there that are inviting consumers to be some part of a decision-making process, whether it go back to Forever 21, all the way up to um, Mod Cloth, things like that. Um, but our platform is submit a design, get enough votes to make a prototype, because prototyping clothes is expensive. Um, once a prototype is in place, crowdfund enough to meet your first run minimums. Once that's done, then you go to production. What we're able to see is a, a lot of people that are, you know, historically probably didn't feel they had an outlet to come up with a clothing design because I don't know a, a factory. I don't know where to buy fabric. I don't know, you know, where to uh, sew shop is. And we're able to take that legwork off of them and then provide this outlet for this whole maker movement that, again, Hashtag hate that term. Um, you know that <laughs> the <Hashtag> but, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, you know, but all these people now have a, a level of an outlet. I think you know we're excited. Um, we really started focusing on this in late August, um, and we love where we're at with the designs that are being submitted. Uh, a challenge that we're having now is we have a core customer base. So how do we prioritize external designs given our you know, rather narrow customer base, um, but that's an exciting challenge to have, you know, to think about scalability. But I, I think there's a lot of uh, good things going on from giving people the opportunity to be part of a greater conversation of retail. So, and I, you know, and I obviously come from a, from a brand marketing and a brand management perspective. I think if your brand stands for democracy, if that's how you're positioning it, if that's how you're creating it, then it feeds in very nicely to what we're just talking about. Um, you know, and Levi's is a very, hopefully, a very democratic brand. I mean, you know, everyone wears it from my five-year-old son to my 85-year-old grandfather and everyone in between and probably half the folks in this room and me who I'm not terribly fashionable. So I think if you are a democratic brand and you stand for that, there are then you can get away with it. And I think that's part of the question is, you know, what is your brand, what is your product, what do you stand for? Um, and I'll be honest, you know, I think with Levi's, we've gotten away from that. I think, you know, over the last couple of years, if you, from a marketing standpoint, we got a little too focused on speaking to the uber, 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 uber progressive and kind of forgot about who the core of the brand is and, and that democracy or that democratic aspect. So you can still be very progressive and you can still be very leading and you can still be rel very relevant, but if being democratic and all that that entails, you know, authentic and real and true to yourself, 
um, still holds true, then you can have the best of both. Very good. So uh, since we're running through a list of buzzwords that no one likes, wearable technology is bringing together fashion technology, consumer electronics, and consumers in new ways. What are the opportunities or challenges for established brands, new brands, and retail? So before, before I came here, I was just read uh, an article on CNN. CNN uh, Projects on Kickstarter that received o over one million dollar uh, pledged funds through crowdsourcing. So, by the way, I find it a beta brand uh, very interesting. So, and uh, and uh, I think number two on that list is a company uh, named em Emotive Insight. Because I studied a little bit of uh, social psychology and social neuropsychology before. So what that new project and product does is in having kind of a headset that will detect your neural uh, physiological activity. Then probably will have an algorithm to mine and understand your neural activity. And so we say whether you are alert, or we are stressed out, or other like in English words, your state in your mobile phone. So that help you understand what psychological state you are truly in and maybe they can be smarter um, um, recommend you what to do what not to do so I found this is a very amazing coaching concept and they call it, uh, we call it a cognitive fitness it's not your physical fitness like Nike leather band stuff but if you saw the image of uh, um, some of the models wearing that thing it looks like you're a patient so <laughs> I was like, oh, this needs like a total new design and user experience uh, up, uh, uplift. So I feel we're building is a new, new avenue for fashion um, established fashion ones and especially emerging ones. When people find a new entry point, where do you enter? I feel wearable computing, wearable computing fashion is a great area for entry. That's great. I think it brings up um, the, the flip side of that, which we talked a little bit about before, uh, would be RFID, iBeacon, NFC, and these other um, micro-location technologies. So some people are evangelists for those technologies and see positive in them, and some people see the negative. Um, are location tracking technologies central to your vision, anyone on the panel here, or what, what would your general opinion be? Are they friend or foe? I mean, from a beta brand perspective, I'd say no, um, you know, whatever, for now. Um, but I, I think from a consumer perspective, and maybe it, because I also have a background in marketing, I think the ability to be smarter, um, send more relevant messages to me based on what I'm wearing and how I'm wearing it and where I'm at is super exciting from a consumer standpoint. Um, I get uh, those of us in this room may be a little bit of a you know island, not you know sim similar to the rest of the world, but. There's something that is super interesting to me, and again, talk about wearable technology. Um, you know, when it's hard, people like to wash their clothes, which makes it you know difficult to integrate a lot of stuff. But um, all of us that have phones, we have a phone for a reason. Probably majority of us uh, do not have a phone because it was the only option that we had. So we made a, 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 a personal um, preference and, and decision to buy that phone and wear it as though it is a charm on a necklace. And so I think the, the leap of faith from that to, I'm sure everyone saw our friend with Google Glass, you know, the most, you know, prominent uh, feature in today's uh, world of, of wearable tech that is getting, you know, most of the, the buzz. But you dumb that way down. I think, uh, Paul, you brought up, we've all been wearing watches for, you know, quite a few years. So the technology leap is, is going to happen and it's just, as long as it's helpful to the end user, it'll be helpful for everyone. I'm tracking you right now. <laughs> Every single one of you are being tracked. No, um, you know, and uh, going back to, uh, with regards to the IB, and I've actually had two meetings about this today, um, you know, for, I, I think it's a couple of things, and you just touched on it, right? It's about relevancy, right? If what you're serving up to me is going to make my shopping experience faster, stronger, better, more convenient, something like that, then you're receptive to the message, right? At the end of the day, it comes down to the consumer and helping the consumer solve a problem. Um, but I also think, you know, from a, from a brand perspective, especially with someone like Levi's who, you know, 
we have our owned and operated stores, but beyond that, I mean, 85% of our business is in Macy's, Urban Outfitters. So, you know, for us, we, yeah, I would love to put, you know, a beacon on our 2,000 square foot shop in Macy's. But then guess what? Lucky, who's five feet away from us, is going to want to do it. And then Macy's Cosmetics is going to want to do it. And then all of a sudden, everyone's going to have their own beacon, and you're just, your phone's going to blow up, right? It's kind of like email these days, right? So if it's relevant and it's permission-based and it adds value, great. If it doesn't, it can backfire, I think, really, really quickly. So there's a lot of value to it. It's, you know, if you use it for good instead of evil. I, I think of, uh, when I think of wearable tech, I think of things that are data collection platforms like the, the job on the headset, the handset thingy, that allows you to track your lifestyle. So if you were to take that data and want to share some of it, when you're in a store, you could actually say, hey, what kind of shoes are good for me? I climb the stairs up and down all day long. So here's my information for how many calories I've burned. What's the best shoe for me? You know, um, or I sweat a lot during the, when I sleep, so what's the best nightwear for me? You know, something like that. So I think it's, uh, if you use that as a data collection platform in some way, I think it's pretty handy. A note to the location-based awareness and the micro-location uh, detection. I think it's just a, a basic piece of technology enabled. I think the viewers work all the same time. I think a key is the currently how the location awareness technology is designed is really poor. I use the iPhone. The iPhone only allows me to either turn it on or turn it off. Does it enable, doesn't give me a very easy way to say, oh, I only want to turn it on for like brands I favor, or brands I frequent, or for a certain time of the day. I don't want to go through like 10, set, 10 different um, changes in the setting, but that just the experience needs to be rethought and redesigned. That could easily be done through an app, right? I mean, if you were to have Nico and Beacon app that would you know, just sort of match you up, you could probably control your preferences a lot easier, especially with mass adoption. So <clears throat> Paul made a very good point about context for consumers and serving relevant content. Um, we've seen a lot of big moves from Amazon, eBay, Google, and Microsoft in the, in the fashion sector. Um, how might this impact other brands, but really how might it come back to benefiting consumers? Well, I'd say most of what I'd say most of what Amazon is doing is great for the consumer. So as Amazon continues to disrupt what's happening in general retail, they're giving you things that more selection in a better findable way, faster than you would want it. Um, you know, and there's obviously not too far off when most people have uh, some form of 3D printer where you go to buy your choices by. Um, a uh, spatula from Williams Sonoma online, or by the printout code of a spatula from Amazon, and just have an email to you print yourself. It starts to disrupt a lot of different things. So I think in general, as big brands put a lot of money around innovation for retail, consumers will, you know, find ways to uh, to, to benefit. However, I do believe the smaller startups are the ones that are going to drive the majority of that through people, you know, smart people that are helping them um, bring, the, bring things to life. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you also look at Google and all those folks, you know, and Amazon, they're making obviously huge strides in terms of shopping and PLAs and things like that. We talked a little bit about it. I think the flip side to it is, of it is there are great or potentially great places, eBay, to go and buy stuff. But they are not a great place to learn about what's new, how do I wear this, what does this brand stand for, what concerts are going on, and things like that. So again, I, I think they're great portals for shopping and convenience. But from a brand marketing perspective, right, it's, it's a terrible analogy. But if you think of like QSR and fast food restaurants, you've got those who have good food, or they're quick, or they're convenient. You can't have all three. Right? Those guys are all convenient, but the other two have better food or better brand or better experience, whatever it is, however you choose to define it. Um, and on all likelihood, they're probably just as fast as, if not faster, because guess what? When you buy from Google, at the end of the day, you're not buying from Google, you're buying from Levi's, or you're buying from Kohl's, or you're buying from Fossil, or you're buying from Tory Burch. So it's also, I think, they're, again, they're great 
shopping portals, but from a brand experience and deeper experience, that's just something they can't deliver. Or should they, I would argue. The, the two uh, concepts I'm thinking of that I'd like to share with the, or with the group here, I think depending on which value dimension you look at. Are you looking at convenience or are you looking at inspiration? So convenience comes at the scale of the platform and the YouTube bit. Uh, the mobile being anywhere. So I, th I see Amazon and eBay, all this, there's a really going into that functional convenience angle. But some of the brands, you think of the fashion is an old industry, but in the last few years in the US fashion industry, there are quite a number, couple of brands that have emerged and been doing very well, They're providing the inspiration like Lululemon, a lot of the women, they love it. The frock shoes, they kind of lift themselves to a next level. Tori Birch is a customer I work with uh, so that they create that inspiration from their brand and their products. So I don't see they really just go in from their convenience point of view. Yeah, I think that's a, that kind of gets to our next question, which was that retail has often been broken down into rational and emotional touch points. Um, and the question would be, will technologies that can promote emotional experiences be the next promising field of competition and development? Because as Paul says, if, if I go on to Amazon and I buy a pair of jeans or whatever it is I'm buying, there isn't really an emotional connection to that brand. Um, so how are brands going to build that emotional connection in the future and how can technology serve them? So I think um, I was reading about some stores that are putting a lot of uh, flat screen TVs in their, in their stores, just lining it up and basically allowing you to touch and feel your weight of virtual products and you know, sort of have a 3D simulation of what your product might be. And also, I mean, to me, Apple comes to mind as a, as a great uh, innovator in that space in the way that you can actually go over there, play with their toys, and satisfy yourself until you can convince yourself to buy it. You know, so it's, it's one of those things that, to me, emotional is, is about touch and feel, right? being able to experience it. And as long as you can promote whatever experience you can promote, I mean, there's, um, there's, I was working with a company a few years ago that was trying to uh, create um, a 3D model of a shoe for you, so essentially you could go to their kiosk, that they were actually, they were actually a kiosk vendor, they would uh, supply the software and the hardware for the kiosk. You could stand on it, it would measure every dimension of your foot and figure out what kind of shoe you actually needed. And then it would suggest to you what shoe in the store actually matched what shoe you needed. So it was great uh, to be able to go there and just in a few minutes figure out exactly what you needed and also have a connection to it, like actually be able to see it and buy it on the spot. The only thing I'd add, like uh, the emotional connection comes beyond, goes beyond just the te technology providing it. Uh, like, I believe being part of a, a community provides a great emotional connection that, um, you know, for a beta brand, I think our brand awareness is way higher than our sales are. <laughs> you know, so it's truth be told, outside of, you know, our bike to work jeans that we have one model here wearing, um, you know, we, we, we don't, you know, we're, so we, we have a discrepancy, but that is because I believe there's a lot of people feel that they're part of something. Um, we do our damnedest to put our customers in front and, you know, make them be part of the experience, the entire flow, be part of our ads, be part of our homepage creative, you know. And that has allowed for an emotional connection that I think goes beyond what a technology um, could provide to make things easier, sexier, more fun. So. I don't know, I think no doubt fashion is foremost emotional. Technology has not been emotional or not associated with emotionality. So that reminds me, like 15 years ago, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, we were exchanging with the MIT Media Lab. So we were looking at emotional affective computing. At that time, I was so young, I was like, what, what does that mean, emotional computing? So I had to do all the experiments to find out what emotion means in the computing world. Now I've been doing the app, app, mobile applications connecting consumers and business for a number of years. I share a couple of examples of how technology, fashion, and emotion can come together. So I think the, the breakthrough will be at the, how you can balance this together. For example, in, for my consumer research, especially for a lot of consumers, especially women, the emotional points is either at the level of, they have a social need. Often say, imagine you're standing in front of a closet, you're figuring out what you're gonna wear for that Friday party coming. You have emotion, you have, a, you have an emotion, right? So now technology, any, not, none of the technology brands can capture that. So we are thinking, um, I was with my team, imagining the use case. One, one use case for that. So think about how, say, you and your girlfriend 
and do a, a virtual um, a chat, picking up from your virtual closet, and they can see your virtual closet, your physical closet in your bedroom. They figure out uh, what to wear. You have your wishes, say from my runway, from Pinterest, etc. Then you can look at how they they will look together on you for that social occasion. So I really like that example my team came up with. I see it's a very down to earth example how that emotion, social emotion and the function come together. Then the, the regular business stuff will come in where you can buy it, you can place an order. Very good. Um, so in, in a technology rich world where everything is available to anyone all the time, which is something that Paul touched on a little bit, um, which brands do you guys think have enhanced the consumer experience through technology? And potentially which are some that may have frustrated consumers? I'm asking you to name names, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. I'll say it again, I still think Amazon uh, is, is, is great when it comes to uh, enhancing customer experience through a myriad of ways. Um, and they've set a bar, you know, and, you know, even my former company at Zappos, like, we, I, I believe we set the bar in what is expected in e-commerce. Like, we expect to have the same quality of service as I do when I go into brick and mortar. We expect to have free shipping, you know, we expect to have ship, uh, our products delivered tomorrow. You know, and I believe, you know, so Zappos is one that, you know, innovated in that area. Amazon innovates around findability, suggested, lookalike, you know, targeting, all these different things. So uh, those are a couple of brands that I would use. I totally agree with that, actually. Amazon is amazing in terms of its uh, path to product and the way that you can access the product and be able to check out so quickly. It really sets the standard of how easily you can check out. And personally, for me, I've, I realize it doesn't have the best best prices most of the time or some of the time. But um, I've always driven to shop there just because it's so easy to do it. And it's so easy to find what I want. And uh, working with uh, different companies to, to uh, develop recommendations. So if you if you ever experience uh, across different sites how products are recommended to you and how relevant you feel they are to your buying history and to what you actually need, it's amazing how intuitive Amazon is about that. Just based on your searches, based on everything that you've done, even though it might not be an explicit activity, even though it might not be an explicit search, just because you browse something, you know, it just is so good about finding the relevant product. And some of that, you know, it comes from the scale that they have. Um, so one of the search algorithms, one of the recommendation algorithms that they use in general across the industry is wisdom of the masses. So if 10 people have bought a certain product, then they're likely to buy this 11th product. Now because Amazon is such a big customer base, it just stands to, to reason that they have the best data on that. So I think it really makes a lot of sense for them. I mean, I, I won't name names, but you know, as a, as a consumer, you know, and someone who handles e-com brick and mortar and someone who shops a lot, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to, I think, pretty simple things, right? What frustrates you? Can't find what I'm looking for. Shit's out of stock. It's back ordered. Links are broken. It's the basic things, um, you know, and, it, and I think, and we see that with a lot of accounts and a lot of partners, like, they want to shoot for the moon, and it's like, guys, you got to fix the basic stuff, right? Your UX is terrible, um, or you're out of stock, or your inventory is terrible. So, you know, that's the stuff that I, you know, that I think everybody finds incredibly frustrating. So it's like, yeah, give me a great experience. Yes, serve me up relevant content. But if you can't fix the basic stuff, it's really frustrating. And guess what? I'm gone. And I ain't ever coming back. And I'm going to go to your competitor or I'm going to go to a different brand. Um, and, and that is, I think, you know, within technology, and we've talked a little bit about it, that to me is one of the greatest risks, right? Technology is a fantastic enabler of you name it. Um, but there's also now the expectations of consumers go up and up and up and up. And those brands and those companies and those retailers that can't meet or stay at the pace of those consumers and their expectations are going to be in a lot of trouble. And, and that is the risk, right? I mean, that's the cash 22 of technology. Very good. Um, so we're kind of coming into the final couple of questions now. And they're specifically tailored around uh, innovation, particularly in the Bay Area. Um, the first one is, where are your R&D dollars being spent? And do you have an innovation focus area? Are you able to share that? 
So for us, our spendings mirror our client spendings. So we, we look at what are up and coming technologies and I'm gonna use the everyone's hated word, omnichannel. That's where everyone's headed towards. So, uh, you know, especially tailoring the, uh, the mobile experience. So everyone's going mobile. So we're actually making our best efforts to figure out what the best UIs are and how to actually make the right formats uh, look good for every device. So that's really where uh, our R&D dollars are. For us, I think um, probably a, a couple things. One, one of the exciting things of uh, relying on the wisdom of crowd to create ideas that want to be brought to life um, is that you get a lot of ideas that amazing people want to bring to life. And then part of the scary side is, well, shit, we're taking on the manufacturing backbone of this, so that's hard. You know, and how do we manage this scale? So we're, uh, a lot of our resources are going to uh, beefing up our production staff to make sure we can handle demand. And then the other half, which, you know, right now I think we're giving a level of leeway. Um, we make a lot of, I'll use a mission term because we're based on mission, small batch, right? So everything is small batch. So that's exciting. Um, and right now it's giving us a little bit of leeway and permission by our customers to actually be out of stock sometimes. Um, and we're actually, you know, I think pretty straightforward about this. It's uh, small runs. We're made, you know, mostly locally. So, you know, but we do have a, a bit of permission. I don't know how long that permission lasts. Uh, so we are putting a lot of resources into, you know, super sexy things like inventory management. You know, which may not necessarily <laughs> be, you know, the next billion dollar offshoot. But if you don't know how many, you know, academic hoodies you have, you have bigger things to worry about. So. And uh, I mean, I think for us, it's a couple things. I think one you just touched on, it, right? It, it's mobile um, is a huge, huge part of what we're taking a look at. Um, mobile as an enabler of omnichannel, mobile as an enabler of everything, right? Everyone's got one, three feet away from you, as most, et cetera. Um, so that to us is you know priority number one. The second priority is a parallel to that is consumer research, consumer relevancy. Doesn't matter what I build, doesn't matter what awesome experience or strategy I come up with for mobile or omni channel. If I haven't married that up with some sort of consumer relevancy, it's going to be completely useless. So we are doing our best to make sure that, you know, that the strategy meets the consumer need and that they're going hand in hand so that we don't all of a sudden put something out in the, out in the marketplace and nobody engages in it, nobody uses it, and we're like, what the hell happened? Um, so it is, to a great extent, you know, mobile and technology very much leading, but at the root of it is also very much marketing 101. What's it doing for the consumer? What need are you solving for? Is it relevant? Um, and if I'm a consumer, why do I care? And those two things have to go hand in hand. We heavily uh, spend a lot of money on R&D because we're the, one of the leading technology and software companies. So the big data mobile consumers with businesses are the big focus. They make it a little bit more tangible, especially tied with what Paul was describing since the an SAP customer. So now a lot of consumers browsing, searching for things on their preferred social media. A lot of, a lot of times, the social media, how businesses are using it, it's just for branding. Then when people go see that someone was saying the link is broken, that's a well-known phenomenon on Pinterest. You see something you like, the link has been broken for a while. You don't know, right? So one focus, one innovation R&D focus I'm leading, particularly in SAP, is to how to match consumers' interest in their social media interaction with the products and services that truly desire. Not in the form of advertisement, not in the form of a paid some sort of a preferred uh, placement, but a more contextualized in what people are talking about, what they need. So that requires me and my team to know both consumer experience, the business, how they operate, how they source, how they allocate across omni channels, to know the experience. It requires me to know the uh, smart algorithm that be able to take the contextual, the static profiles, the location, the time, and the metadata of the products and the images, all this fun, fun, the challenging stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fantastic. So with all that said, um, 
what does a 21st century brand experience look like? And what San Francisco brand is leading the charge in this area? Simple question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I will say that, uh, that I'm excited about what we're doing. Um, you know, I, I think the, the 21st century brand has much more, it, it wasn't that long ago where the biggest ad budget won. Right, and we're a long ways away from that now. And I think really what you need is, is an environment and experience that really invites uh, consumers to be part of a bigger story. And I think that's where uh, companies, you know, such as Beta Brand, um, located in the Mission in San Francisco, <laughs> <laughs> support local. Um, no, you know, co companies like us, I, really what we're trying to do is, is build this story around, you know, building a brand together. And I think that's something that has been left out of the whole brand experience for consumers for a long time. Um, at, at, at Zappos, I was fortunate that we had a, a very loyal customer base that wanted to tell our story. Um, and so that made my ad budget stretch a lot farther than I would have otherwise. At Beta Brand, we're seeing the same thing, where people are excited about being part of a story and, and being part of the experience that they're telling the story for us. And that, again, lets my ad budget spend a lot farther, lets earned media go a lot farther. Um, you know, and, and I think that's where more brands are going to be headed. They're going to be more inviting. Um, they're going to be more uh, communicative. They're going to be more uh, daring and probably fewer bricks. You know, I think that's more or less what's going to come down to more showrooms, but uh, yeah, back office distribution, which will be really exciting for consumers. Um, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what it's going to look like, but I can tell you one thing, and that is the consumer is king, right? And again, I mean, for me, because I'm on the marketing side, it comes back to marketing 101. I have no idea what it's going to look like, but I can tell you one thing for certain, right? The consumer, those brands, those companies, those businesses, whether it's brick and mortar, e-commerce, whatever it is that I can't even imagine a store on the moon, those that put the consumer at the center of that universe are the ones that are going to win, right? I, I mean, I think, you know, if you look back to whatever, 1890s, Print advertising was it, right? That's what everybody did. It was awesome. It was the next thing. 1940s, gold age of radio. That's, you know, pure soap, Coca-Cola. That was technology for them, right? That was the digital landscape back then. TV in the 70s and 80s, that was the digital landscape back then. Um, and then obviously today it is the digital landscape. And I think, you know, when you look at brands like Levi's, usually not always, um, Ray-Ban, Coke, BMW, whatever, those brands that are, uh, that are iconic, and some of them are also, you know, even today, smaller brands as well that are iconic. I mean, you don't need to be a four and a half billion dollar company to be iconic, but those brands that are iconic in some way, shape, or form understand their consumer, and they put them at the center of that equation, and whether that is a great consumer experience, whether that is serving up something convenient, whether that is meeting a consumer need, whatever it is, those brands and those companies that, again, understand their consumer, and I think to some extent it also goes back to the data and all the back end, um, those are the ones that are, have won, and I think those are the ones that are going to continue to win. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're selling soft drinks or apparel or you're flying airplanes, that's really what it's going to come down to, in, in my mind. I think to me, in the future, I, I, value, I would value findability and, and things that are um, intuitive of what I'm looking for. So I see a future where maybe Google goes one step beyond uh, what it's doing right now, which is uh, mapping the inside of malls to mapping a store shelf, You know, being able to figure out where in Nordstrom's you can actually find the pair of jeans you're looking for and knows that from your phone because you made an inventory of the things you want to buy that day. Right, so you go out there and you have a price point in mind and it knows exactly what those things are and points a few things out to you and you just walk straight there. So you stop wasting your time and you figure out how to get things that are more relevant to you. So I just, uh, I think data mining is the future. Data brand in the mission. <laughs> okay, I got it. I'll be the last to go. Yeah. I really love this question because it reignited my path. Design and create even fashion brand myself or working with folks. So this is how I imagine 
a 21st century fashion brand from San Francisco, I would agree. It has the following three properties. First, all its material is made of organic, natural fabrics, like cashmere and silk, no polyester. So it's organic. Uh, second, it's smart. So when I wear the, my sweater and garment, you know, it's like, oh, your stomach is not doing very well. You need to eat more of this. You know, why not? Because it's the most intimate thing to my body. And the third is democratic in the sense it allows me and customers who do like my branded products to, as, a, as a way of learning and expressing their lifestyle. Democratic in the sense it, you don't have to conform to Hey, you're going to earn a lot of money to buy a Louis Vuitton bag. Even Louis Vuitton bag is not your aesthetic style. It doesn't fit your lifestyle very well. Very good. So thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of interesting things tonight from personalization to fabrics that know what I had for lunch to <laughs> fantastic innovative brands in the mission and iconic Denim brands that have been around for 150 years. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, I think, um, and it's been very fertile ground. What questions does that raise for the audience? Yes. You also have to pretend to have, have, have a microphone. Looks for a mic to No, they have to pretend to have a microphone as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fire away. Um, I recently read about the context of the government and the say so fit is hard um, and and it, it's you know the number of cycles that we would spend at Zappos talking about how do we get this more realistic is it, it's it's really hard um, the one thing that that came about was that that we I don't think we really appreciated um, until it was like screamed in our face part of the shopping experience is social so you can have as much fit on the front end when you're at the store you're still going to try something on, and you're going to ask your girlfriends, how does this look, and how does this feel, which is a reason I think the social shopping experience hasn't really caught on. Um, for I could see three modeling for guys because we're not as not to you know we're, we're not as smart when it comes to shopping. We'll just buy something that's convenient and easy, um, and then we don't spend a lot. We're buyers, not shoppers. Um, you know, but but I think when when it comes down to the there, there's and I can't think of her name or the company's name, a former Amazon exec who left and she's doing something from uh, particularly her launches in denim based out of Seattle. The point being, you more or less walk into a dressing room and you do some level of scan, which I think. Uh, not a lot of, not all women will be super comfortable with. Um, and then what they're doing is based on uh, um, whatever 
what do you say, hip thigh ratio, that, that magical algorithm, um, I think you should patent it, um, they just start bringing in uh, uh, pairs of jeans for you to put, wear on. So they're doing an actually really interesting job marrying uh, digital and physical, um, where her storefront is literally you know, 20 feet deep, and then her back office is a warehouse. You know, so really shifting to this, this really is a showroom, and I'm bringing all these based on things that should fit me. Um, but I think it's really hard. But I mean, so uh, traditional retail, and I, I'd love to hear if you think otherwise, but you know, you're gonna average around a 30% return rate. What's amazing is, Zappos has like literally the most liberal return policy ever. They're in line with industry standards. So people behave the way they behave. Um, so it, it's, it's not easy. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think when you look at, you know, uh, Myality and those physical machines, I think the online component and, you know, with that, I think part of the reason that, at least from our perspective, it didn't get adopted particularly well is it's only as good as the information you input, right? It's a data, it's an algorithm. So it's only as good as the information that we provide. And I think about the genes, right? Yeah, and, and I think to your point, fit is really hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is hard. It is phenomenally hard. Um, and I think, you know, back to, I think the example about the physical machines, that's an example of what I was talking about, about consumer relevancy, and you just touched on it, is great, you know, women have a really hard time finding a pair of jeans that fit them, so stick them in a portal, it'll transport them, and it will zap lasers, and it'll tell you, these are the jeans for you. But, and, and it's no offense to those that have done that, and some of them have been successful, but I think others of them was like, Guys, did you even think about you know whether a woman wants to stand in the middle of a machine, standing in the middle of a mall or a Macy's? I mean, no. Who wants to do that? So that's why I say it comes back to the consumer, right? Put the hat on and say the technology might be awesome and it might be really beneficial and it may or may not give you a great fit, but as a consumer, as a man or a woman, am I really comfortable taking that action? But how awesome would it be to download your body scan that we all have at every airport yeah. and then put it in your Fitbit so when you walk in, you say, here, I've already got it. <laughs> Too much detail. <laughs> one, one insight to share, I was actually I was talking with a person who used to work for the company that behind the reality. And so apparently, so I think the typical way, correct me if I'm wrong, the fashion brands, they design uh, to the a physical mannequin. So there's no one size fits all. So say Prada uh, targets certain demographics versus maybe Kate Spade or some other brand uh, target different demographics. Even the boats size eight, they mean different measurements. And in, from the design merchandising point of view, in the, in the origination of the fashion product, it has been determined. So maybe the fit problem has two fold. One fold is just fundamentally, the products of the category, that type of brands you're looking for are not made for your body type because you're not one of the target consumers. So that is a harder problem. Then a easier problem is you are one of the target consumer profiles, you just haven't found it. Then that type of technology will match your body data with the detailed measurement data, typically in PLM, in PLM product life cycle management software, typically not in e-commerce uh, uh, software applications. Then they will just match the two. Very good. Um, is, uh, is it Hoenter? Is that the denim brand you're thinking of, Aaron? In Seattle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you're interested, point it. Yeah, yeah. This gentleman here had a question. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, where do you see the value of uh, the evolution of the value of making America um, uh, and like what spreads here, which are spreading much negative to your product and the side, like the other brands and the other brands and the I mean, will you be the brand one day uh, to, 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 to match this? 
well, is it divide at one point three by uh, is a factor in the US? Is there any value to it? How do you see the evolution of that? What do you say we so we never can we also see about just not design the American, so I guess it's important in a way. I mean, so very uh, transparently, about 80% of our products are made in the U.S. Of those, about 95% are made in San Francisco, Bay Area. Um, the remaining is in, we have like one line of jeans that are made in L.A. Um, the, but we have about 20% of our products are made overseas. You know, going back to, we want all the super organic, you know, high-touch product, but we want it for 1995. And that is a challenge for consumers to say, okay, I'm willing to spend this much money. I think, you know, you have people like Everlane who is doing something interesting with the, their transparency, um, but the scale purpose in today's world sort of dictates some things. And there's like in a, in a very beautiful garment industry, particularly in denim in LA. There's a beautiful knit industry in the Bay Area, but it's small, right? So it, I think it would take some time. It, I'm not, it's not all on your shoulders, but you know, <laughs> if um, North, or I'm sorry, New Balance brought, uh, I think all of their factories back to Jersey or Pennsylvania or something, right? That, that makes an impact. And then when that happens, you can bring scale and value more in line. Um, and when we're a trillion dollar juggernaut, you know, evil empire, maybe we'll start looking more holistically at that. But we do know that our customers are willing to pay more for items made in San Francisco and we can actually get faster turn, and the terms on cash flow are better. Because if you move something overseas, you're paying up front on a six month build out, which is garbage for a startup, so. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, and this is just me speaking, because uh, I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of Ellis and Co. Um, I, I think part of it all depends on to get all MBA-ish, but it, part of it depends on your business model, right? I, I mean, I think, you know, within Levi's and within certain brands, there are products and product lines that, you know, to your point, that folks want something that looks good, fits reasonably well, is on fashion, is on trend, but I want it for 20 or 30 or 40 or $50. But then I also think there is also, you know, to your point, that even within Levi's, we do have a small made in America component, but it's a higher price point. Um, and it's not a higher price point because of margins and greed, it's because it is more expensive to produce here. Um, and there are consumers that are willing to pay extra for that. And there are a ton of benefits. I mean, we go back to one of the original questions around you know, being able to move quickly and being able to use innovation to adjust and respond. Well, part of the benefit of being made in the U.S. is, guess what? I don't have to wait four months for that thing to be hauled on a boat across the ocean and sit in a warehouse, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there is absolutely a component of that that says, for those who want faster styles, more relevant, et cetera, that's one way to go about doing it. Um, you know, and I think someone like Keen Footwear is a great example. You know, that is... That's a company who, based up in Portland, offshored all their shoemaking, just as just about every other major brand is done. Um, and somebody in their finance department crunched the numbers and said, "Like, dude, you realize all we'd have to do is raise our prices seventy-five cents to have it made, like four blocks from our corporate office. And guess what? We can build an innovation lab. Uh, we don't have to ship that stuff across the ocean. So, you know." I think a lot of other companies are taking a deeper dive into the business model to see, is that actually viable? And I think, you know, others like New Balance, I think some of them are using it as a marketing handle and credibility and around democracy. I think others are actually looking at it and saying, it's actually now a pretty viable business model. Um, and it may not cost a ton more. So Keen is a perfect example of that where someone crunched the numbers and was like, actually really not that much more for us to build it, and you get a ton of benefit from it. A ton of benefit. You can respond faster, quicker to market, you can prototype faster, which in apparel is incredibly important. Like, good luck trying to prototype something that is made overseas. It's really hard. Oh, and guess what? Everyone that's on your design team doesn't need to go and jump on a plane and spend $2,000 and then hang out in Thailand for a month, which would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> But you don't need to do it, so it's a bit of both. Very good. So I think we're pretty much out of time. Maybe, what do you think? 
one or two more questions. Um, this lady here. Um, you mentioned that Amazon is more of a brand of convenience, but you've really tried to step into you know, more fashion and that inspiration space through their Twitter and their ads. And do you guys think they'll ever be able to cross over completely into that inspiration or fashion space? And you think they'll always be the brand and buyer, you know, curtain rods or textbooks? I mean, so I became a little close to that, to Amazon after the acquisition, but one thing I do know, people don't expect Westfield to be super awesome, right? But they expect to go into the Tory Burch shop and be really inspired. I don't see a reason, whenever the brands, not that long ago, Levi's wouldn't let, you know, um, uh, the Zappos and Amazon of the Worlds to, to sell. I believe there's no reason for a digital experience to not be enhanced and allow that to live with inside any given number of marketplace channels. Um, and Amazon is spending tons of time, energy, and resources in doing that. You know, Amazon.com slash fashion looks entirely different than Amazon.com, right? And so you can see where it's beginning. It's a long ways to go, right? and I think, but what it will take is some of these major brands that, you know, I think Tori Birch, I'm sure she's like, fuck you, I'm making 1.2 billion, I think, last I read, you know, without using Amazon, I like my margins. Um, but I think a couple of these brands will start to step into this distribution, get a little hook, and then just now force and find ways. You know, you'll see people like, I think Coach Bags are now available in, in a lot of places. Coach I wear, obviously, when you license things, I, I get differently different. But at some point, you can start to appreciate how the brand experience in a digital marketplace can actually be enhanced. Oh. Well, add no to that. I think the, the current way how the digital experience is designed is only at its infancy. So the Amazon on Macy.com, when I visit, it still feels like a catalog. But if you look at some of the startups locally, like from the Pinterest to Polyvore, how many, like the Polyvore I see is getting a little closer to that emotional connection, then I think that's still just the beginning. So we should push the envelope of e-commerce, mobile commerce, that social like, interest sharing side of the app. So it fits into a lifestyle. It doesn't matter if it's a cheaper Old Navy t-shirt or Tory Burch tunic. So it can fit that lifestyle rather than just browsing catalogs. I think it's interesting you should say that because we've uh, experienced, so, uh, so Macy's, for example, has the whole concept of what we call a brand shop. So you know how you walk into a Macy's shop in a physical location, and you actually see, say, Chanel has its own little counter, and within that little counter in that space, it's just Chanel, right? So you're living the Chanel universe. So similarly, online, you can actually have that same experience, which they do have, which is tailored just to what they call brand shops again. So again, the same thing, the same physical feel is replicated as a microcosm of the entire Macy's site. So I think given that Amazon started from a bookstore kind of evolution path, they're very familiar with focusing on a vertical. I mean, going onto a separate vertical shouldn't be that big of a challenge for them. I'll talk about is conversion rate. So from e-commerce, conversion rate drives a lot of decisions. And we'll spend you know, countless hours, should this button be moved 10 <laughs> pixels to the right? Um, a project that we worked with at, uh, again, not to keep going back to Zappos, but I think it's kind of relevant. We worked with Nike, and they wanted to create more or less Nike.com within Zappos, so going back to the store within a store mindset. And we spent a lot of design and development resources more or less doing that. And very quickly they said, whoa, this sucks because this conversion rate is nowhere close to what your, the rest of your shop is like. Um, and so you start thinking through that of when it comes down to what are we really trying to do now? Now, now you're getting out of, I don't want to control my brand. I want to expose my brand to more masses, but I, want, I also want to do it for a sales perspective. Um, that starts to get a little funky. So then I think you, you, 
the combining of those two becomes a little hard. And I don't think it is a fast experience. You know, I totally agree. E-commerce today is really just catalogs without pages. Um, but we're super young in this. You know, so as much as we want it faster now, there will take some evolutions of us getting through. We talked a little bit of a joke. You know, infinite scroll. Like, holy shit, it's the greatest thing. You know, it's like, that's like six months old. You know, like, let's calm down on what our mindset is. And, you know, really realize this. I think it will take some time, but I really think it'll take some big brands and some thought leaders to be comfortable in this environment to really help push it forward. One point here, it sounds easy conceptually, but it's really complex. So many factors and layers there. For example, one of the factors that's required to provide that connection between you as a segment of one and a branded line or a product being offered is that thing or that offering needs to understand you. Because what are you, your preference, your way of browsing, maybe you're more functional, you want to get something quick in and out, some people are more into the browsing, they're more occasion, social, context oriented, everybody's different. Then it becomes a, a big challenge how you can create one application that fits into that mass. Yeah, you're creating it all. Why don't you just do it? <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. You just asked. We're just getting there. <laughs> Wait a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Lady at the bank. No, it's always, oh. again, it's that the, the correct uh, answer was the conversion is really it. It's what drives it. Like, so um, all the metrics, I mean, there's comparative studies across what the competitors are doing. At the end of the day, you're crunching the numbers on what that particular feature is going to get you. Yeah. Lady at the bank. Um, okay, so. How are you? So, with beta brands, they can you said that you guys take more lives and then sell through and then. You guys do the order, and what's, uh, you guys have to get the and take the whole Yeah, so we do. Uh, um, so the, the really fast way it works, you go to crowdfunding. Um, we can tell pretty quickly on a, a early sales velocity in crowdfunding if we need to increase or cut our cut tickets, right? So one, we don't have to create the cut ticket until we see some traction, but two, we can increase the cut ticket before the lot is done. So that's helpful. Um, then what we try to do is watch, once it comes to life, then does sales velocity continue at the same or increase or decrease rate? Uh, unfortunately, or based on you know the size of the company, who we are, it is not the number one priority we have. Um, so that's where I was getting into. We spend, right, we will be spending a lot of time focused on inventory management. Um, so. This season, season, how much do you have? So, we have some staples that sell year round dress pants, sweatpants, executive hoodies, uh, bike to work. Our whole bike to work, work year is, is strong. Um, but, you know, where we're a, a big challenge uh, transparency. In this uh, uh, new crowdsource, crowdfunding idea, timing is less relevant. I may have an idea for um, you know, swim trunks that I submit in January. Well, we need to get energy around that in January when no one's thinking about it. So what's the right timing to bring this to life? And um, when you look at a traditional, people can speak much more uh, eloquently than I can. Traditionally, you're looking at a nine to 12 month lead time from design to you know, creation. And we're trying to shrink that and just by definition doing a lot of it off sales cycle. So it's hard. And then so what we need to figure out then is once something comes to life, is, is there a cyclicality around that that we're, we need time to understand before we make future buying decisions on that? I don't know if that even answers your question at all. So what I want is thought of, my biggest challenge is what do I cut? Because I don't want to cut yeah. With the new brand, you don't get customer feedback yet. And I don't want to cut something, keep it inventory, because that's just money yeah. lost. Yeah. So, so that, I, I guess, our attempted solution to that is to put it through a voting. Does it have interest enough to make a prototype? If so, put it in a crowdfunding. So are people covering our front costs? And then if so, then we'll 
find the best way to manufacture it. So we have a couple stop gaps in place uh, before we are into a long you know, inventory situation. I'm sure everyone wants 15 day turns. We're not all lucky enough to be there, but we're also not on a you know, 12 to 24 month turn cycle as well. And those are a couple things that we do to try to make it closer. And we are, each run is pretty small. Um, you know, we're talking really in the couple hundred range, you know, two to four hundred range. So in the end, you can probably sell that many at our size. I have a question just bouncing back to my uh, fellow panelists and this person. So transparency, you mentioned transparency uh, a lot. Typically design uh, a, a brand, established brands that don't reveal their new brand concepts in the working. Right. They do start, say, nine to 12 months earlier. But you basically kick the the, the, uh, the beta brand. You expose everything from beginning to the end in transparent. So I'm just curious in how maybe you and Paul and others react to this transparency as a disrupting, disruptive factor. Yeah, I think consumers have the luxury of not knowing. We were talking a little bit about factories, I think. Um, they just went it to show up at the right price and fit, you know. So transparency can get you, I think, so far. Like our transparency is that first item in our think tank, it's a sketch. Right? So there, there's not a lot going on there. The prototype may or may not change a little bit from the end piece. But where we've been fortunate to have the, the uh, permission by our customer base is because they know that it's, it's a limited run. They know that it's part of a sort of inner circle. And we incentivize the crowdfunding piece. So you've never seen this. You will never see it if it doesn't come to life. So we will give a tier discount based on when you are willing to give us your credit card. Um, and for that may sound harsh or something, but in retail, we need credit card numbers, right? So that's what we're trying to do. So you know, we're, we're trying to be transparent through the process. Um, but in the end, that is so that we can make better buying decisions to run a profitable business. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's an interesting discussion around transparency, and I, you know, and to some extent, again, the consumer is going to gauge that, and they're going to be the ultimate arbiter of that and the ultimate judge of it. Um, I think in terms of transparency, and you guys are doing this, and I think other brands and other companies who are transparent. And Levi's to some extent, but I think transparency comes with leadership, right? So if you are the leader in your category, I can be transparent because I know I am one step ahead of my competition. I know that more often than not, that there is some relevancy, that there is a consumer demand around this thing. So I think transparency is really rooted in leadership, however you choose to define what that means. Um, and clearly, you guys are a leader in that space. Zappos is a leader within their own, uh, within their own category. And with that comes, uh, to some extent, the luxury of transparency. Um, you know, the challenge with that is if all of a sudden you wake up and you find out that you're not the leader, that's where the conundrum comes from. And, that, and that's where there is actually a lot of risk. Um, and then all of a sudden, well, you're not as transparent as you once were, right? So it can be a bit of a love hate. You know, we are also fortunate that we're more, well, arguably more fashion than we are tech. You can be a lot more transparent in fashion than you can in tech. You know, so you know, our proprietary, uh, proprietary, it's proprietary. <laughs> our special sauce is, uh, you know, we have a community that, you know sends us a lot of photos of them wearing our product, you know, and we can argue that we have more on site, more photos of our per product than anyone else. So there's a, there's something interesting there that is part of something bigger. So, you know, that all of you can do that, you know, and we just feel we're in a good position, good starting position there. And I think also with transparency, it's, you know, if I'm not leaving, I can be really transparent and I can say, I'm copying your business model. 
right? But do I have the credibility to do that with the consumer? Probably not, because I'm being so transparent that they're going to call me out on it and go, what are you guys doing? Right? So again, you got to be careful with it. There is definitely a fine line in terms of being transparent from the standpoint of being very authentic and being very genuine and being very connected with your consumer and you know the feedback that you get and just being transparent in terms of I'm copying my competitor and there's no credibility with that. Um, so we're scheduled actually for a few more minutes and if we have any more questions. Yeah, of course. My name is JD. We have a tech startup going on called Fastener. So we're here because we're trying to merge fashion and function. And uh, is retail tech driving up prices, down prices? Is it flat? Is there any? I know it's a general question. Mm -hmm. I'm just this, but is like the, what she was mentioning earlier, where it's like, oh, you get scanned and it fits in your pants, that would be perfectly like, that sounds expensive. You know? And, um, is our price is going up because of retail tech, or our price is flat and there's more profits because, of, because you're using analytics and data to make more profits, or our price is going down because of those analytics so you can be more efficient as a Great question. I, I don't necessarily know if prices are, I, I don't know if we are, we're in a situation of margin inflation. Um, I don't think any of us would, would really say that in, in fashion. Um, because the R&D behind it is still expensive. Um, the product itself is still expensive. Um, and then you still have to deal with macroeconomic issues. I mean, you can look at someone like uh, whatever TJ Maxx parent holding company is, right? They're having a banner holiday season because people are still trading down uh, to, to buy uh, lower price items. Um, whereas that's not necessarily the case for everyone else. So price elasticity, I think what we have seen is there is some elasticity of made in America, made in San Francisco. Um, we have some elasticity around community base, uh, but you know, the, I don't know if I would say that the technology around there, uh, around the creation of product is such that we're all just getting fat margins. I think it's still <laughs> pretty thin in retail. From, from what I've seen, it's usually the initiative is counted on as being being able to pay for itself. So if you're developing some sort of new technology, then you're hoping to scale up in terms of selling volume that it actually pays for itself. So you're not necessarily price gouging the customer to recover your value, but rather just kind of scale up and eat up margins from other, other competitors. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is also when you speak to technology, is it a component of your fashion, your brand, your style, and something that's expected? then maybe that carries a more premium price, right? Apple is an example of that, or partially is an example of it. Or are you using technology as an enabler for your business, and it's just the cost of doing business. And without it, you're gonna fall behind, you're gonna be less relevant, your competitors are gonna beat you. So I, I, I think, you know, for us, I don't, yeah, it's a margin neutral component to it, but again, I think from a technology, it's like, is that part of your brand, and is that what you're standing for, and is your consumer willing to pay a premium, and therefore higher margins for it, or is it something that's underpinning your business? Thank you all. So um, without further ado, I think that brings matters to a close. I'd like to thank the panelists for coming, um, and giving us a phenomenal um, debate this evening. I'd like to thank Retail Tech Forum for putting on the event and for General Assembly for kindly hosting. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>